to look today at something which to me is the enemy of the inquiring mind, which is video games. Video games seem to me to stand against everything that this lecture series is about. In fact, the term mindless pap comes to mind. So, as I said to you last time, Socrates believed in the inquiring life, the examined life. It was a life of reading and thought. I have only one slide to go through today, and I feel that this image says everything that I believe is necessary to know about video games. They're a substitute for life, not an extension for life. We live in an age, it seems to me, in which the virtual world is taking over the life world. We only have to look at the effects of video games, whether it's obesity, ADHD, the hopeless addiction that they seem to inspire throughout the world. I read recently about a boy in Japan who played a video game for 72 hours and had to be institutionalized. Some of you will say that's an exception, but I'll say, yes, it is the extreme of a long continuum. As an educator for many years now, I've spoken to parents crying in my office, saying to me, he doesn't do his homework because he plays video games. There is a pattern, I think, between poor achievement in schools and video game play. I think there's a pattern between video game playing and youth obesity. And I could go on and on about the negative correlations. But today I've invited Mr. Anderson, who is an apologist for video games, who is going to be defending the whole idea of video games. And at the end of the lecture, you'll have the opportunity of asking him some questions. Mr. Flynn, if I am to defend computer games, I must be true, I must be authentic. Therefore, I show behind me now the image that Mr. Flynn has of me. As a gamer, this is what I look like. Some sort of subservient, substandard basement dweller who is unable to be socially comfortable who merely resides in a pit of his own making. But what is a gamer if not somebody who wants to remake themselves in a more superior and heroic image? As Mr. Flynn said yesterday, one of the great philosophers of thinkers, Socrates, also looked to another philosopher called Plato, who spoke about there being a parallel world of ideas. As gamers, are we trying to place ourselves onto here? Well, if I'm going to talk about this with truth, I must concede some points of our gaming apology and say, yes, there are some exceptional cases of extreme danger in games. Now, a few folks here who have spoken to me already about the games they play, usually FPS games or football games, those click, click, click ones. Who here plays any MMOs? Ones where you play massively multiplayer online games. PUBG, yes, hands down. One of the most famous ones of these was uh, the Final Fantasy series, where a collection of 30 individuals from across the world came together to fight one end game boss, the badly named Pandemonium Warden, and they literally fought for 18 hours non-stop. After 18 hours, the game clicked, and the Pandemonium Warden healed up maximum health, and some of the players started, started to fall ill. Is that gaming? Is that useful? I think games like that actually are the ones that cause the addiction, that give gaming culture a bad name. I should also say, though, that this idea of dedicating yourself to an art is particularly useful, particularly important. James Joyce, who is one of my personal favorite authors, probably the most famous modernist author of the 20th century, once decided it was a useful, useless time to spend a whole day deciding whether or not to put a comma into a single sentence, and the whole of the next day deciding whether or not to take it out. He's respected. So what's different between him and that of gamers? Before I start our apology in earnest, I must make these concessions. Those here who play and like music are aware that the music industry is somewhat nefarious. And the reasons are for those points behind me. The first of all, the music industry exists to make money, just like the gaming industry exists primarily to make money. And I think this bastardizes and despoils what gaming should be. Look there also that a lot of games that are made, particularly again the click click mobile games, and to a certain extent PUBG, but not quite just later on, 
They're designed also by behavioral psychologists who will see how long you'll play the game before, before you quit. And some games are designed that if you're a bit naff at the game, it will even get easier just so you'll spend longer on the game so you still, that you'll see more adverts. Is this what gaming culture is about? This now is our transition from our concessions to our true apology. If we are to give a true and thorough defense of gaming culture, we must look at this clear distinction between high culture, the thinker, the person who is of the world, of the flesh, as much as they are of the mind, and the fat, geeky, comic book guy from the Simpsons. Clearly you want to be a bit more like a thinker. Look at that inverted pyramid. At the top clearly is high culture, at the bottom, in the basement dwellers, is the low culture. Now, believe it or not, books like Frankenstein and literature like Shakespeare was considered to be low culture. There existed a time, not too long ago, a few hundred years ago, where if you studied Shakespeare at university or at school, that would be seen as light entertainment. Something not really worthy of your intellectual endeavours. You would not be sophisticated if that was something that you liked. However, in about the 1950s and the 1960s, films were then studied at university. Look at that pyramid. What happened to the status of literature when films were studied at school and university? Pushed up the status of literature. Therefore, this is what I say to you now. When gaming was pushed and studied at university, and yes, for our year 13s, it is possible to study gaming at university now. There are some courses. In fact, I understand that right now, this afternoon, it's possible to apply for a course in gaming in one of the world's top three universities, which are, of course, Oxford, Cambridge, or Hull. <laughs> Joking. Only two of those are good, because everyone knows that Cambridge is a complete dump. <laughs> Hull itself offers a gaming uh, degree, and having done this, film that was previously seen again as base culture was now pushed up. This is 2017 and those who are watching this lecture in the future, Mr. Anderson predicts that, at that when we are able to um, study social media at university, you will then see that gaming is pushed up and seen as high culture. Just imagine in 20, 30 years, your son or daughter comes home from school Mum, I've got to play PUBG for two hours to experiment and see you know, what it means. It's so boring. The same thing happened before with Shakespeare. So, to make this transition into apology, these are the things, Mr. Flynn, I want to say to you that makes gaming more than just this horrible addiction. The most important point is at the bottom left. And like with chess, like with the greatest team sport, the art comes as it is created. The mode of experience and the mode of creation are as one in a virtuous circle. You also see there, there's a certain social interaction that makes it powerful as well. But some games I'll show you today that I know that you've not yet seen raise strong moral questions. Finally, for those of us who are taking on literature, there's some really interesting games that show advanced narrative techniques that I would also want you to see as well. The first game is Eve Online. Who here has played Man. It is my privilege to introduce this game to you. This is possibly the most dominant MMO game going, with a player base of half a million people. In it you play a pilot in a future dystopian like western sci-fi world. And in it you can do anything you want. Usually shovel across, take something from one place to another, or fight. In this game player base of half a million players, people form into corporations. The magic of this game is you can do anything that you want. And this was proved about five years ago when one player spent two whole years being a double agent for one corporation. He pretended he defected one corporation to another. He would even fly across America to attend house parties of other players to convince them that he had betrayed his original corporation and he had joined the other one. At one key moment at four in the morning, American time, Geek time, as they call it. He, um, he went into the gaming bank vaults and he withdrew in the game two billion credits 
which equated to 10,000 pounds or 50,000 dirhams of real money and put it into his own bank account. At this point in the game, huge battles erupted across the player base where fathers and sons and daughters and mothers dumped their jobs, dumped their families to play this massive battle online, as you can see depicted in here. In the aftermath of this battle, over half a million dirhams of in-game ships were destroyed. The players, how did they react? They said to the moderators, this is not fun, this is not part of the game. What this guy has done is illegal, he stole our money. <laughs> the moderator said this, he said, the guy didn't then withdraw the money, the money's still in the game. And actually, this is a beautiful thing. This is exactly what we want this game to be about. Moral questions were raised. Just as an aside, it's really important to note is that that is maybe an extreme example. There are cases of people, there's one that I know in China when I was in Beijing, um, was shown across national news, spending far too long in games and not enough time on his A-levels applying for university. His father hired an in-game high-level character to assassinate his son's character multiple times until his son was finally able to quit the game and try to achieve his A-levels. That was the game. Here is, I think, a similar game that most of you would be interested in. So Daisy, or uh, playing on Battlegrounds, this one is this common Battle Royale game, currently the top-selling game on Steam, the PC platform. And in it, it raises some particular moral questions. All of these games come from an original game called Armour 2. Who here has played the Armour series before? A-R-M-A. -A. No, hands down. A few people. Armour is a military simulation. It's not actually a game. If you play COD, a game, a very popular franchise, it's about $6 billion each time they release the new version. If you shot a few times, what do you do? You retreat, you hide down, you see some ketchup in the corners, and then the blood rapidly washes from your body and you're fighting fit again. In Armour 2, like in war, one shot, you're dead. Sometimes you'll die straight away, sometimes you might be like 10 seconds before you die. But at which way it's meant to be a simulation. Now about five or six years ago, a very famous mod called Daisy, Day of the Zombies, was born. And in it, the original plan was that players would group together and kill zombies. But what do you think actually happens when you put random people together in a survival situation? People started killing newbies and each other. And they found actually that the players were far more deadly than the zombies themselves. And I myself played this game for about six to eight hours, and only on one occasion did I meet anybody that didn't kill me straight away, usually commenting on how well they knew my mother at the same time. <laughs> This moment when I met this one person, for about five minutes we spoke and kind of like explored this particular part of the game together. And I remember, even now, stood here in front of you, this absolute sense of knowing that if I shot this guy, I can get his guns and his ammo, and the game will be easier. And even though it's just a game, for some reason it really meant something there at the time. Playing on Battlegrounds is interesting, it's useful, but playing it, it's really easy to respawn again. Day Z, well, you play it for sometimes an hour and a half, 90 minutes before you see somebody. So they shoot you, it gives you that horrible feeling. Which game is more enjoyable? Like PUBG, like obviously. Which game did I feel more of an experience? Day Z. Another version of this, though, is a game made by War Child. This goes beyond winning and losing, and this is certainly the kind of game that I would want you to play. In this, you play a family or, or friends who are trapped in a war-torn scenario. Imagine a place in the world where that would be. In it, you scavenge for shelter, food, and perhaps some of the things to entertain you. But the game is not simply something where you're trying to pop up health bars and such like. I played a version of this game where my family ran out of food. And when the characters scavenged, then they found a tin of tuna. And the choices were either give it to the father character in order so he has more health and stamina and vitality, discourage in the future. Maybe I want to give it to the child who is actually so weak that they might die. Or maybe I needed to, needed to give it to instead the mother who was so disturbed at this point that she might actually break. In the game, I gave it to the child and the next day the mother had committed suicide. 
go online, some people have got like wind guides to this game, and it's obviously completely beyond the point. This is an indie game, and this is the kind of game that you want to be looking at to play. And for two hours, that was enough. Who's played Company of Heroes? Do you know what I mean when I say an RTS game? The biggest difference between um, the first person shooters and the RTS games is that the RTS games are far more cerebral. In this, you play a general in an army where you can control um, infantry, uh, tanks, so on and so forth. In it, you can also play this part of the Russian front. In the Russian front, at one point in the game, it deliberately designs itself so that you have too many people to control and too many enemies to fight. It has no save function. So play for half an hour and you have that horrible feeling of frustration that all my time is going to go down. I know that I need, I need to do some marking. I can't do any more on the game. Eventually my army's overrun. I'm there saying some like interesting words myself. But then the game just reveals that actually that was meant to happen. And that whole slew of other soldiers come on the field. And you realise that war is not about winning or losing. It's about a different experience instead. So, I've been mentioned to you about these moral games. I'm going to show you very quickly three or four narrative-based games. Have you folks heard of Dear Esther? It's a modification for Half-Life. Who here has played Half-Life? Again, it's a privilege to introduce this to you. It is considered to be the best game of all time. I would say now, it is the best paced game of all time. Look online, Half-Life 3 means like a bound because Half-Life 2 is considered to be the best game that's ever been made. The is a game where you walk through an island. It's based on this experience of someone who used to live in Wolverhampton, so clearly it's a horror game. <laughs> and from this, the question is, is this a game or is this a, or is this a story? Deus Ex. Heard of it? You must play this. I remember I first played this in 2000 when I was um, at university. I played it, I completed it, it was 25 hours long. And I was sat in the Resnikov bar and I said to one of my pals just how much I enjoyed the end of the game where me, as this like, future um, like sci-fi soldier, teamed up with my brother in the game who took down this corporation. And I will never forget how my pal said to me how he shot his brother in the head for a laugh in the first five minutes of the game. And researching this further, the game's got 10,000 hours of possible gameplay in it and one choice can change the entirety of the game itself. This really is something different. This really looks at games in a different way. I'm not even going to ask you about this game. Okay. I know that you know. Usually the first Elder Scrolls that you play is your favourite. So again, like to think in say 10, 15 years time, this might be your favourite version of this. And if your sons or daughters will like a different version, like Elder Scrolls 5. Thousand. Again, in this, it's possible to put a certain PC mods to make choices that are quite nefarious, quite evil. And the game allows you to do so. You can be a character that's not wholly good, nor wholly bad. And I think that makes this game really good. Morrowind, the third version, was much, much clearer in this. You could be a character that really was quite bad in some ways, and the game would still continue. In the later versions, the problem is that the developers are trying to make it so that the good options lead to better gameplay. Which I is quite weak. I think it should be the case that an evil option still allows an enjoyable game. It's your choice to do so. Have you guys seen this yet? I was an 18, so you're too young to watch it, but when you are 18 and you watch this, this is a film game where every half a minute a choice has to, has to be made. It's high production values with a budget of several million pounds. It's being shown at New York Film Festival, in Radiance Film Festival. It's available on Steam right now. It's an incredible game. Check it out. Now, one thing I was saying to the gents here at the front of the room before the start of the lecture is this. Mr. Flynn, as you say, we have to be very careful about the nature of how we want to push these games to our students. One school has been in operation for about 10 years now called the Games Institute in New York, where the entire curriculum is experienced through playing of games. They learn history through playing civilization. They take a tribe from Stone Age to the space um, fairy stars. They also discover maths through playing Victoria too, where they take an industrializing nation. Maybe they can learn about moral quandaries from playing Daisy. This is a school that exists right now. Contact them, it's possible to go and see what they do.
This now is the penultimate slide, and I just want to leave us on a few ideas about this idea of what it is to be underground. When I spoke to you about this war of mine, company of heroes, and to a certain extent, Deus Ex, these are not mainstream games, these are what we call underground games. I'm sure you know again that with the music industry, we have mainstream music and underground music. And personally, I would find it really cringy if like, my teacher liked underground stuff. Because by the nature, underground stuff needs to be something that's part of your culture and not part of mainstream culture. Mr. Flynn, I say that yes, the commercial, popular, industrial games are nefarious and they are evil. Looking around now, we can see that in our school, our education of games is quite weak, truth be told. And it's these indie games that are actually the games that are worth a slave. So this is the last slide that I leave you on. Who here has ever watched the play, the film version, History Boys? Put your hand up for us. My life, hands down. This is a film that you absolutely must watch. This is you right now. A collection of people, they're in a northern grammar school, and they're at the cusp of going to university. They feel the pressure of bettering themselves. And each of these has a certain personality, a certain type that hopefully you will recognize yourself in as well. In it, they have two teachers. Two taps over there, and the form tutor. One teacher is the trendy young teacher who teaches the idea of education and thought of being about style and um, the other chap, the fat bloke in the waistcoat, teaches about the importance of high culture. And the heart of all of this is the idea that to really be full, true men and women in your life, you need both the high culture and the low culture equally. And if you commit yourself to only one part of that, to only play the FPS game, you're not or you're missing out massively so from this. Some of the best art, like Shakespeare, is both high and low. The references to high thinking art, there's the most depraved, nasty joke that's also made within the same breath. I'll leave you with this. On there are two words, movies and film. Movies, of course, are things like Shrek and Die Hard. Film, things that are more difficult. Apocalypse Now, Interstellar. Do we yet have two different words for game? The day that we make this word, and maybe at some course in your life, you'll be culturally influential enough to make that division there yourself. I know this, um, uh, four chaps in Newcastle who quit their jobs, they made their own developing studio, and from this they a game called Project Zomboid. Have you heard of it? Tonight, go on, Google it. They sold 250,000 copies of this game before they even made it at the price of £10 for each game. They are redefining what it is to make a game, to be a gamer, to make games, does it mean about dedicating yourselves to it? It means two hours having an experience that you couldn't have with anything else. Mr. Flynn, the desk, I have convinced you of how gaming is so important. We need both the high ground and the low ground.